uh, Tennessee is recognized. Thank you, Chairman Brown. Welcome, Chairman Powell. Um, under, the, under your tenure, Mr. Chairman, the Fed has taken the stance that the 2% inflation target shouldn't be viewed as a snapshot in time, but rather it needs to be achieved, quote, sustainably. When inflation was running well above the 2% target back in 2021 and early 2022, the Fed was patient and allowed rates to offset the below target inflation that had occurred in the years prior. It strikes me as odd now that while we're still well above target inflation and have been well above for the prior year, markets seem to expect the Fed to immediately cut even before we've breached the 2% inflation threshold. So my question is, is this, if the inflation rate reaches 2%, would that be considered a return to the target rate on a sustainable basis? Or is it still the case that inflation would need to more or less overcorrect to well below 2% before the Fed makes the rate cut adjustments? So we, um, it would take us a while to really get comfortable that inflation had set, settled in sustainably at 2%. But that's not our test for, for uh, changing interest rates. Interest rates right now are well into restrictive territory. They're well above neutral. And we've said we would not wait for inflation to get down to 2% because if you wait that, you know, monetary policy works with long and variable lags. So we've said, you know, for some years that, uh, that we would start restoring uh, the, the federal funds rate to a more normal, almost neutral level. We're far from neutral now. Yeah. And so, you know, we do plan, um, assuming the economy moves along the lines we expect, we do plan on on starting the process of dialing back restrictions. I'm, I'm just trying to square look for the symmetry. I, I know we sort of allowed the economy to overshoot uh, when inflation was high. And, and we sort of made up for prior years of low inflation. I'm trying to square that with the fact that we, we didn't actually do that. We, we adopted a framework that said we would do that. But then we got suddenly a few months later, we got an, a, almost an explosion of very high inflation. That's not what we were looking. We, no. we said, you know, moder moderately above or modestly above 2%. This was not modestly above 2%. And we reacted. We, we thought that the, the mistake we made was we thought that that, that, that inflation would go away. Uh, that it was quickly, transitory. When transitory, which means not. it goes away quickly without effort by us. We figured out at the end of 21 that that was not the case, and we acted. And you don't see, see that same abrupt dynamic coming the other way? You're more comfortable no, with that? No, I think, I, I, look, I think we're in the right place, which is we're waiting to see, we're waiting to become more confident that inflation is moving sustainably at 2%. Mm -hmm. When we do get that confidence, and we're not far from it, it'll be appropriate to begin to dial back the level of restriction so that we don't, you know, drive the economy into recession rather than normalizing policy as the economy gets back to normal. Yeah. Can we go to the balance sheet um, and talk about that? Um, we've seen a dramatic expansion of the Fed's balance sheet over the past couple of decades. In 2005, it was at $800 billion. It's at $7.5 trillion a day. <laughs> it's doubled since the pandemic uh, was underway. And through quantitative tapering, the Fed is attempting to, to reduce its footprint. And the concern I have is, on the other hand, government spending tends to just continue to be profligate. We're running now a trillion dollar deficit every 100 days, and we're flooding the market with treasury debt, and we're push putting upward pressure on interest rates as a result. And what I think that is lost on, on many of us here is that the spending levels will only make your job harder when it comes to lowering interest rates, not to mention there's a tacit expectation that the Fed will step in once the markets can no longer absorb our new issuance. Uh, I think this is a very serious problem. I think it deserves more attention. And I think we're now at a point where your objectives may be you know, very much uh, at odds with the behavior of our fiscal policy. And, and, am I missing something here, Mr. Chairman, or does increased net issuance by the Treasury lead to higher rates? I mean, in principle, more supply should lead to modestly higher rates, but that's not going to affect what we do. Um, that's not a problem for us. We're, you know, our, our balance sheet normalization is running very much as expected. We've de decreased the size of our holdings by almost one and a half trillion dollars. I, I hear you. I just, I, I think it's troubling that we continue to put physical pressure by continuing to put, again, we're, we're running a deficit of a trillion dollars every 100 days, and the issuance is required to deal with that. We're putting a lot more pressure, I think, on the Fed, and again, making your job harder. I think we need to take that into consideration. A a another component of this topic, uh, your colleague Governor Waller said he liked the Fed to shift its holdings toward a larger share of short-term treasuries. Back prior to the financial crisis, about a third of the Fed's holdings were in bills. Now they're around 3% of 
of your total securities holdings. Do you share the goal with, with Governor Waller? And if so, how long will it take us to, to get there? Take a while. You know, that's, that's an issue. We're in our FOMC meeting in a couple of weeks. Uh, we're going to have our first really deep dive on what to do with the balance sheet. That's one of the issues. I don't think we'll deal with that at this meeting. But over time, um, you know, you'd love not to own a lot of MBS. And, and, and I can see a case for shortening uh, the maturity. But it's not something, you know, it's not something that would happen quickly. And, it's, and you know, we're, we're, not, we're not actively looking at that. That's sort of a longer term aspiration that I think he was just, just one final point, Mr. Chair, and you and I have talked about this before. Yeah. We're, we're, we're in an election year. You're getting a lot of pressure, I hear it from lawmakers, to uh, adjust rates. I'm not telling you to raise rates or lower rates, but I'm just here to emphasize the fact that the credibility of the Fed depends on your remaining data-driven. The credibility of our currency as the, as the reserve currency of the world depends on that, and I encourage you to continue to maintain that posture. Thank you. Will do. Thank